Pentecost was an exciting time in the life of the church. Before Pentecost, the disciples were walking around like chooks with their head chopped off, wondering what on earth was going to happen to them and trying to make sense and process of what had gone on before. When we get to the beginning of the book of Acts, we see that Jesus is taken from them, that he goes back to heaven, and he tells his disciples to wait for him in Jerusalem until the power, the spirit of power, comes on them. And so in obedience to his word, they take off to Jerusalem. They go back to, to the house where they were staying uh, at the time, and, uh, and they wait. And so they spend their time praying and waiting, praying and waiting. What's this all about, this, this gift of the Holy Spirit? Now you need to know that for those disciples, the Holy Spirit wasn't anything new. If we go back into the book of John, in chapter 20, we see that after Jesus was raised to life, he met with his disciples uh, and walked, walked into a room and uh, they were scared. And he told them not to be afraid. And then it says, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit receive the Holy Spirit. And as he breathed on them, the Holy Spirit entered them. And uh, for Christians, that's nothing new. When we are baptized, we are promised that we get the first installment of the Holy Spirit living in us. Uh, and so we already have the Spirit inside of us. But that's not the same as saying that we are filled with the Spirit or that the Spirit has full control or total reign in our lives. And that's where many people are stuck at the moment. They know that they have the Spirit, but they don't and haven't experienced the fullness of the Spirit. What it means to really be completely left open and let God fill you and do what, what he wants to do. Well, this is where we pick it up in chapter 2 of Acts. But in chapter 2 of Acts, the Holy Spirit comes. When the day of Pentecost came, uh, just to unpack that for a minute, the day of Pentecost uh, was the Feast of Weeks. It was called Weeks because it happened seven weeks and one day after the Feast of Passover. Uh, it was a feast that people had to come to, to Jerusalem if they lived within 20 miles, or if you're in the new money, 32 kilometers around Jerusalem, then you were obligated to come and participate in the feasts. And it was an agricultural feast. I mean, seven weeks earlier, the first of the barley crop was offered. And now, seven weeks later, the wheat harvest is, is in and finished. And there's another celebration. And so on the 50th day after the, after the harvest began, they had this big celebration. It was a day off. No one was allowed to work. People didn't mind that at all. And uh, they came out and, uh, and celebrated this. Uh, Pentecost is the Greek word for 50th. So it was the 50th day after the last feast that they had celebrated. Uh, later on, we also find out that because the country was moving away from an agricultural society, that they were looking for other connections with their past. And uh, it was decided that Pentecost was also the day on which the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. So, double celebration, double remembrance. Anyway, the city is full of people because they don't just come from the 32 kilometers around Jerusalem, but people who were living a long way away overseas in other countries longed to be in Jerusalem for the feasts. And so the place was packed. All the, all the vacancy signs gone, and the place was humming, absolutely humming, with visitors as well as locals. Well, the disciples were waiting 
for the power to come, for the Holy Spirit to come. Uh, there were 120 of them and they were in this house. They were all together in one place. I'm reading from chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Just imagine what that would be like. You're in the house and you're waiting and you're praying and the next minute, whoosh, God, this enormous wind comes. Supernatural wind inside the house. That would make you scratch your head. And not just that, but when you look around you, you see all of a sudden that there are tongues of fire on the heads of the people that are there. A visible, a visible way of seeing that the Holy Spirit had really come down on them and that they were now filled with the Spirit. It's just mind-boggling. Interesting that young Julia just said that she saw tongues of fire on people and that she saw uh, flashes going backwards and forwards. Pick up on that in a minute. So you can imagine that they had this amazing time and not only did they know that they were filled with the Spirit, but they started to speak in languages that they'd never learned as the Spirit enabled them. Big theological debate. What were these tongues that they were speaking in? Were they tongues of human languages or angelic languages? Or were they the language of the people that were outside waiting? Uh, the answer, the theological answer is, we don't know because it doesn't get spelled out. We do know that they were speaking in languages that they hadn't learned. Uh, I remember a famous theologian from England, a Baptist minister, who did his doctorate on this passage. And having studied the texts backwards and forwards in the original Greek and, and whatever he could lay his hands on, he had to answer the question, what happened on the morning of Pentecost? And what was this speaking in tongues all about? And... Uh, Having finished writing his thesis, his conclusion was, we don't know. <laughs> so they gave him his doctorate, because he didn't know. Because he proved he didn't know. Because he proved that he'd done the research, and you couldn't prove one way or another what was happening. Fascinating stuff. Anyway, it doesn't just affect the 120 people in the house, because they were staying in Jerusalem, verse 5, from every nation, God-fearing Jews, under, from every nation under heaven, because they were there for the feast. When they heard this sound, these people going off in languages that they hadn't learned, and they weren't whispering, they were speaking loudly, they came to check out what was happening. So a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each of them heard them speaking in his own language. Interesting that it didn't matter what language the disciples were speaking when they were speaking in tongues. It was heard by the people who were outside in their own language. They could make sense of what they were saying, even if the disciples themselves didn't really know what they were saying because they were saying it in a language that they hadn't learned. So... They're utterly amazed and they asked, are not all these men who are speaking here Galileans? Uh, it's not just a reference to the part of the country they came from, but uh, Galileans were people that you looked down on. You know, They weren't the erudite, scholarly type people. They were the, the people that you didn't expect to do this sort of thing. But... So they were amazed that they were Galileans. How is it that each of us hears them in his own language? Uh, and then they 
go out in explaining what languages. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia. Oh, by the way, I'm not speaking in tongues, I'm just reading out the, <laughs> the countries that they were coming from. <laughs> Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? But some made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Well, Peter takes the handle to that when he speaks, uh, because he says it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Come on, you know, how can they be full of wine? Uh, it's too early. I mean, the pubs weren't open all night, you know. <laughs> That's not how it worked. But fascinating that when Peter gets up and preaches the first sermon to all those people who are scratching their head wondering what's going on, and he explains what, what the gospel was about and what Jesus had done, the result is astonishing. Because 3,000 people made a commitment to make Jesus their Saviour and Lord that day. 3,000 is not a bad go, is it, for one sermon? Can you imagine if you had 3,000 people turn up, uh, they'd given their life to the Lord, and now they come to you and say, what did I just do? And how does that work? Uh, how would you cope with 3,000 people? I mean, home groups? Hello? Discipleship, uh, it's just mind-boggling. But uh, when you read on, the next day, another 2,000. And it just multiplied, it just exploded. And somehow they coped. Uh, now, was that, that amazing sermon and that result on this day, where 3,000 people gave their life to the Lord, a one-off? Can we now say, well, that was then. Uh, the church had to be born. The Holy Spirit had to come. Uh, well, that was then. This is now. So, nice story, but what's the relevance for us today? Well, I want to tell you it's just as relevant today as it was then. And that the same Holy Spirit that was poured out on people at Pentecost is being poured out on people today in many places. And the difference between having the Holy Spirit in you as the first installment and being filled with the Holy Spirit is astonishing. Because all of a sudden, if you're filled with the Spirit, uh, you have a way of God communicating with you and God communi communicating, you communicating with God that enables you to be far more effective in the job that God has set us. Uh, You can imagine hundreds of thousands of people in Jerusalem. Let me just take it back to Toowoomba for a minute. The pastor from the COC spoke at a meeting and said, the best guess was that there were 10,000 people in the Toowoomba regional area who identified as Christians. Now, quite a few of those would be nominal Christians, but there were a number who would be fair income, spirit-filled Christians who, uh, who had given their life to the Lord with, uh, with all integrity. 10,000. And then he pointed out that census details show that if you include the university students and the people who live in, uh, in colleges, in boarding houses, 165,000 people in the Toowoomba regional area do the maths. 10,000 people who identify as Christians, 155,000 people who don't. That's a bit of a field of harvest, isn't it? How did we get to the 155,000? Well, we haven't been particularly successful up until now. Uh, what tends to happen is that Christians meet within the four walls of their church. They get topped up and fed. They hear more about what they should be doing. 
but not too many of them are actually out there doing the stuff because uh, they don't feel equipped. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the equipment is part and parcel of the deal. And all of a sudden, if you're open to what the Spirit is saying, instead of focusing what goes on in the four walls, you begin to focus on the 155,000 out there who don't know Jesus. Uh, in the workplace, at school, at uni, wherever you may be. And if you're open to what the Spirit is saying, and you are actually able to make a major impact in the lives of these people, not because you're brilliant or smart, but because you're listening to what the Spirit is saying and you're willing to act on it. Now, still a tall order, isn't it? 155,000. Uh, I mean, how many of the 10,000 people who identify as Christians need to be born again? That's, a, that's another, another issue to be added. Well, the good news is that it doesn't just depend on us who are in churches. Because the scriptures make it very clear that there are others involved in the kingdom work. I'm reading a book at the moment called Angel Armies. It's written by Tim Sheets. He's the brother of Dutch Sheets. And... Uh, he indicates over and over again that there are angel armies that God wants to release to help us with the work of building the kingdom. And so in the book he spent 10 years studying angels and he was astonished when he did the study on angels how often they actually appear in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. For instance, in the Old Testament, beginning in the book of Genesis, Jacob had ripped off his brother Esau and had taken off with the birthright. Uh, he'd done very well where he had lived, but he was now back on the way to meet Esau and he thought, I'm in for it now because uh, he's going to get me. And as he was making his way towards Esau, he saw the groups of angels. Now, I've read over that story many times, but the angels never really came out to me. If you go to the book of Joshua, when Joshua is ready to attack the city of Jericho, having just moved into the promised land, uh, as he walks outside the camp, he sees this military person out there and says to them, are you for us or against us? And this man says, neither. I'm the captain of the Lord of hosts, of the Lord's army. Uh, uh -huh. So it wasn't just Joshua and his warriors who had come over and who were going to take the city of Jericho. The heavenly army was there as well because the commander had made himself known to Joshua. And one of the famous stories in the Old Testament is where uh, Elijah is... Uh, being hunted by Aram, the soldiers of Aram, and they surround the area where he is. And his servant, Gehazi, is uh, absolutely terrified. He races in and says to, to Elijah, Look, we are surrounded by them, all these soldiers. And Elijah says, Well, how many is there of us? And so Gehazi counts. One, two, two of us. <laughs> but interesting what uh, Elijah then says. Lord, open his eyes so that he can really see what's, what's on. And when his eyes are opened, he sees the heavenly armies absolutely surrounding the army of, of, of uh, the Arameans. And all of a sudden he realizes it's not just two, it's two plus the heavenly army. And it doesn't even come to a fight because the heavenly army takes care of it all. And those stories are found throughout the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Remember in the Gospel of Luke when Jesus is born and uh, the shepherds are out in the fields and uh, they get the message? There's a heavenly army 
out there. And they're telling, talking to them, telling them. In our Christmas uh, pageants, we hear the heavenly army singing, but there's nothing about singing in the, in the story. In the Gospel of Luke, they call it the heavenly host. Now, they're not part of the catering corps in, the, in, the, in heaven. <laughs> they don't bring out the refreshments to people. In the, uh, host is the word for army. And, uh, and one of the titles of, of God is the, the Lord of hosts, Adonai Sebaoth. That's one of his, his honorific titles. So there are angels, and uh, they were there to participate in the war and in the game. Well, in Toowoomba, things are exactly the same. I mean, in this church we've seen angels and uh, different kind of angels for different purposes. But the intercessors who work across the city and who hear and see in the spirit have told the pastors that there are heavenly armies, angel armies, stationed around the outside of Toowoomba. They're in barracks, they're in their tents, uh, and they're waiting. They're waiting to get the, the call to get into it and do the battle. Uh, so when we think of the 155,000, don't just think about us few in churches that are in town, but the heavenly armies are out there as well, waiting for the instructions to come and get involved. Um, the prophetic words that have been coming over the last five or so years are all about another great awakening. We've had two great awakenings in the world. Well, the prophetic word is that God wants to unleash the third great awakening and uh, that this will be a season of fresh Holy Spirit fire. Hallelujah. And uh, the condition that people talk about is believers should be so saturated with the Holy Spirit that wherever they go, those they come in contact with are touched by the life-giving power of the Spirit. Well, that, uh, that requires some doing. And over and over again, we're told the greatest days in church history are not in the past, they are in your present and in your future. So, we can wait and think of the olden days when the Holy Spirit worked, uh, worked mightily, and when angel armies were at work, or we can actually look to the future and say, well, the best is still to come. Amen. And the best is still to come, and it doesn't depend on us on our own. So what happened in Act 2, when the Holy Spirit came? God wants to reproduce. And this time he says... In the third great awakening, I'm coming with my heavenly armies. And friends, some people are worried about the demonic, and they say, oh, you know, there's so many demons around, and, uh, and, and Satan is, uh, is running the place. But if you think logically, when Satan was cast out of heaven, he had a third of the angels with him, that leaves how many? Two thirds. Two thirds. That's a decent majority. So even if you think logically, you know that when it comes to a fight between the demons and the angels, well, the angels are two to one. Good odds if you can get them. We've got them. <laughs> and we have. So this morning, on the, on, as we remember the day of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit, I want us to think bigger than what we thought before. I want us to think beyond the four walls and the people that are here now and think of all the people that the Lord wants to bring in, fill with his spirit, so that they in turn can go out and make a difference in the community in which we've placed. 
I'd love to see the odds change dramatically from 10,000 to 155,000 to the other way around. Yeah? And it's possible. And it's part of God's plan. And I know that because I've read the end of the book. And, <laughs> and in the kingdoms of this world will be the kingdoms of our God. So we know the end result and we have the privilege to be part of playing our part, making it happen. Now, I know that quite a number of people here already know about the Holy Spirit and are filled with the Holy Spirit. But I also suspect that there are people who have uh, been touched by the Holy Spirit uh, at baptism or at other times when they made a commitment and have the Holy Spirit living within them, but they're not actually filled with the Spirit and the Holy Spirit hasn't got total control of your life. It's a little bit like a, like a house. If we invite you to come to our house for dinner, bad luck. <laughs> and we say, come at six. And you come at six and you ring the doorbell and I shout, the door is open, come on in. You might make your way into our little foyer but you might feel a bit iffy about actually coming into the house itself until you actually get the invitation. Come on in. Uh, we're in the kitchen, or in this case, Val is in the kitchen. I'm in, <laughs> I'm in my study preparing the next message. <laughs> but you see, you're in the house. True, you're in the house because you've come through the front door. But you haven't actually got the full use of the house, have you? Because you haven't been into the, the rest of the house, into the lounge room where you can sit down and where you can enjoy fellowship and company. Well, the analogy between being in the house and having the full run of the house is similar to what happens when we have the Holy Spirit living within us and when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit means that he has full access to the whole of our being and is able to fill us and refill us and refill us as we need to be refilled. Because what happened here at Pentecost wasn't a one-off event. They weren't just filled once. When you read the rest of the book of Acts, you see that in other times they were being filled again or topped up. The reason for that is we leak. And, and when you leak, you need to be filled up again and topped up again. So there may be three types of people here today. There may be people who uh, have the Holy Spirit living within them, but only in the front lobby. They haven't actually given total control of their life to him and they haven't been filled with him. There are people who have been filled with him, but uh, they've been leaking. And instead of being refilled, they are, uh, they're, they're slowly draining. The Holy Spirit is slowly draining out of them. And there may be people who've never even made a commitment to Jesus and say, what's this Holy Spirit all about? I've never had the Holy Spirit explained, and I don't know whether I have the Holy Spirit living within me, even as a first installment. Well, today God wants to deal with all three groups. So... If you're filled and you're overflowing with the Spirit, God bless you. Wonderful. <laughs> if you've been filled and you've been leaking, well, this morning, as we pray, there'll be an opportunity to get topped up. And if you never made the decision to uh, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, today you can ask, and you know what? He's a good God, and He will give you the desire of your heart. One of the common things that I hear people say is, must I speak in tongues? Do I have to? Is it necessary for me to speak in tongues? Uh, well, uh, the answer is uh, no. And the proper question is, may I speak in tongues? Because he doesn't force you, but it's a gift that he freely offers. And a lot of people who have had the experience of being released in a language that they've never learned consciously uh, will tell you that 
It's an affirmation for them that the Holy Spirit has filled them. But you must never say that unless you speak in tongues, you haven't been filled with the Spirit. Because God is unique and he does things uniquely with different people. A good friend of mine who was a minister at, uh, at Rangeville before me had an amazing ministry of deliverance and uh, was well known all over the country as uh, a leader in, in deliverance ministry. I'm talking about the Reverend Dr. Colin Warren. When he met with Pentecostal pastors, they would say to him, well, we can tell because of the ministry you have in deliverance that you've been filled with the Spirit and you speak in tongues. And he said, well, actually, I've been filled with the Spirit and I minister in deliverance, but I don't speak in tongues. And uh, that really messed with their heads because they thought that if you were filled with the Spirit, you have to speak in tongues, that that was the evidence. Now, later on, uh, he asked for the gift of the Spirit and he was speaking in tongues. But he was a clear example of someone who was filled with the Spirit, operating in, fully, fully operating in the gifts and not speaking in tongues. So when people tell you you have to, no, don't believe them. And when you have Christian denominations who tell you that unless you speak in tongues you're not even a Christian, uh, no, don't buy into it. Uh, just trust God and let him do what he wants to do in your life. But I do know that the gift of tongues is not for select few, but is for anyone who seeks. And God is very willing to offer and bless and give. So if you're in a situation where you've uh, never had the, the infilling of the Spirit and you would like to speak in tongues and you don't know the experience, this morning there are prayer team people here who would love to pray with you and uh, would help you put that issue beyond doubt. And if you're in the category today where you've never even made a commitment to make Jesus Saviour and Lord, it's all new and different and you don't know what I'm talking about, well, today is also an opportunity for you to be prayed for. If you've come to the point and say, I want to do this, I want to see what these people had, and I want to have it in my life, well, the prayer team is able to minister with you as well. So, we're not on our own. The angel armies are there waiting for instructions. And we're going to be partnering with them in seeing the city of the Woomba one for him. And we don't do this by ourselves, but we do it with all the other churches and, and all the other people who aren't in churches but who are switched on believers. We're in for an interesting time, the third great awakening. Let us pray. Father, thank you that all those years ago your Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. And thank you that there was this mighty violent wind which filled the house and tongues of fire that rested on each of them. Visible, visible manifestation of them being filled with the Holy Spirit. And thank you for the gift of tongues that they received and that so many people in the world today have. Father, you are an amazing God and you've shown that you have a plan and purpose not just to grow a congregation or a church, but you're into city transformation and you want to change the values and the culture of, this, of the world that we live in. And you've invited us to be part of it. Father, today we offer ourselves in you, your plans, your purposes. We're willing to step up. We've sung the words in the songs that we've sung and now we hear again your challenge for us. As the Holy Spirit came, Holy Spirit, come today. Minister to your people again gathered here. We give you all honour and glory in Jesus' name. And anyone who would like prayer ministry for whatever purpose, whatever reason, you're very welcome to come to the front.
and uh, our prayer people would be ready and we'll, we'll pray for you with, uh, on any subject that uh, is on your heart at the moment.